So today we're going to start talking about cellular transport. And this is the idea of how things cross through the membrane and either go into the cell or out of the cell. So we've talked about how we have this plasma membrane. Okay, so this is our plasma membrane. And then let's call this inside the cell and outside of the cell. And so that membrane is going to act as a barrier between the inside and the outside, and you can think of it as kind of like a gate. So it's going to help um, control what can pass in and out of the cell. Okay, so when we talk about cellular transport, we're talking about things either leaving the cell or entering the cell. So there's a variety of different methods of different things entering to the cell and exiting from the cell. However, they all fall into two different classes. So the first one is called passive transport. Okay. Um, think about if you're just passive, like you're just kind of sitting back and you're watching. Um, so passive does not require energy input from the cell to make that happen. Okay, so it just happens on its own. The other one is active. So that's actively trying to get things in or out of the cell. So active transport requires energy. So when we look at our different types of cellular transport, we can look at it in a little bit more depth. So our first type is passive transport. Remember, this one is just passive, so it doesn't require any extra energy. And there are two specific ways that we can do passive transport. So one is called diffusion, and the second is called osmosis. And then again, if we need to input energy, that is called active transport. So today, we are only going to focus on diffusion and how diffusion works um, to get substances across the membrane. All right, so I want to begin with just a thought experiment. So if I were to open a bottle of perfume at the front of the classroom, how long would it take for the scent to reach the back of the room? So think about that for a second. Would everyone smell the perfume at exactly the same time? Or would certain people get to smell it before others? And if so, who would get to smell it first? The second question is, what if I put the bottle on a hot plate and turn the heat all the way up? Would it take more or less time for the scent to reach the back of the room? So again, I want you to think about that. It would, would it happen faster? Would it happen slower? Would it happen at the same time? Would everyone smell it all at once or would certain people get to smell it first? So take a few minutes and think about it. So go ahead and pause this video, make a hypothesis, and then discuss it. Um, it says with someone sitting at least three seats away from you, chances are you are watching this from home. Um, so you can just discuss it, think about it in your head if you want. All right, so hopefully you thought about this little thought experiment for a little bit. Um, so I wanna go back to question one. If I were to open a bottle of perfume at the front of the room, um, it would probably take a while for the scent to reach the back of the room, if ever, right? And I also asked, would certain people smell it first or would everyone smell it at once? Certain people would smell it first, right? The people who are closest to um, where I was, where I initially opened the bottle of perfume, they would smell it first first and it probably smell the strongest and then that scent is going to dissipate throughout the room depending on how strong it is um, it might make it all the way to the back of the room and it might just spread out so evenly that by the time it gets to the back of the room um, there may not be much to smell it kind of depends second if I were to put it on the hot plate um, it would speed up the reaction but again um, people up front would of course smell it first before it traveled all the way to the back of the room so this idea of the perfume particles spreading out is representing something called diffusion. So diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And so now I want to break apart that definition so we can understand it a little bit better. So first, I'm going to start with just concentration. So we define concentration as the amount of substance in a particular area. 
So if something has a high concentration, it means that there's a lot of substance in a particular area. And if something has a low concentration, it means that there's just a little bit of the substance in that particular area. Okay. And then finally, when we say the net movement, we're not talking a net like a basketball net. Net is just like the overall. So it's the overall movement of particles from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So if you go back to the perfume example, when I first sprayed the perfume, all the particles, let me draw this, they're all gonna be bunched up together. So I'm gonna have a lot of particles in a very tight space. So we're gonna call that a high concentration. And then they're gonna move around the room and they're going to evenly spread out and it's gonna to move to a lower concentration. So that's why the people who are sitting up front when I first spray the perfume, um, they're gonna smell it first and they're also gonna smell it the strongest because they're gonna be able to um, like observe and experience more of these particles as opposed to someone in the back of the room. By the time they get back there, they're gonna be way more spread out. Um, so if they smell it all, they're gonna have a lot um, less strong or a much weaker scent. Another example is just thinking about food coloring. So if you were just to drop some food coloring in water, so at first right here, we have a very high concentration. We have a lot of these colored particles all in one small area. And then if you just watch, they're eventually gonna spread out. So we're moving from high concentration to low concentration, and it's gonna keep spreading and spreading until all of the colored particles are evenly spread out through the entire um, flask of water. So the most common form of passive transport across the plasma membrane is just simple diffusion. So that's just particles moving from high concentration to low concentration across that membrane. Now the rate of the diffusion does depend on temperature and it depends on the size of the molecules involved. So if we go back to the thought experiment, um, we said if the perfume was heated, it would move quicker. And so um, the same is true when it comes to simple diffusion. So if molecules are at a higher temperature, they're gonna diffuse faster. And it's because there's more energy. Also, smaller molecules are gonna diffuse faster than larger ones. It's easier for them to move through that plasma membrane. Um, so you need to remember these, that higher temps allow diffusion to occur faster, as well as smaller molecules. When diffusion occurs, it always occurs down a concentration gradient. Um, so that's just kind of like vocabulary, if we will, of how we would say it in biology. So it occurs down a concentration gradient. And by concentration gradient, we just mean the difference between the concentration of a particular molecule in one area and its concentration in an adjacent area. Um, so this is going to be our concentration gradient. Okay. Um, so on this side of the area, we have a lot of molecules. So we have a high concentration. Then on this side, we have a very low concentration. We don't have any molecules on this side. So diffusion is going to occur, occur down the gradient. We're going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So these particles, they're going to move from outside the cell. This is our extracellular space. And they're going to move into the cell, so into our intracellular space. Okay. Um, and so then here's our look at a period of time. So as time goes on, more molecules are going to move into the intracellular space and more are going to keep on moving in. Now, when they move into the intracellular space, these particles move all around and they can bounce back and they can go and exit the cell. But if one exits, probability is just that another one's going to enter. Okay, so the molecules, they're free to go either direction. So they can go back and forth, but the overall movement 
or the net movement is going to be that molecules on this side of the cell are going to move inside to the cell. And this process is going to keep going until we reach even amounts, until the concentration on this side of the cell is the same as the concentration on this side of the cell. So when we get to the point where our concentrations are the same on both sides, we call that a dynamic equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium just means the concentrations are same on both sides. So again, here's another um, diagram. So here we have a high concentration or a lot of particles in this area. On this side, we have a low concentration, so just a couple particles. And so the movement of diffusion is gonna be from the high concentration to the low concentration. Okay. And those particles, they're gonna keep moving until we get to here. So if you look at this picture, we have the same amount of particles on each side. So we've reached dynamic equilibrium. Here's another diagram showing this using the food coloring example. So here's my clear beaker of water and I'm just about to add the food coloring. When I do, I have a very high concentration and that food coloring is going to keep on spreading out until it's evenly mixed throughout the water. So again, this is what we call dynamic equilibrium. So, so far, We've talked about simple diffusion, which is just when substances can freely um, move from high concentration to low concentration through the plasma membrane. And this happens all the time in our cells because our cells need substances. So our cells need water and they need certain ions like chloride and sugars. We also need um, lots of other ions too, like potassium, but I figured I'd keep it simple um, and just list a couple. And so when it comes to the plasma membrane, some things can just pass easily through and other things cannot. Um, so for example, water can just easily diffuse across the membrane, but there's a lot of substances that can't. Um, they can't just pass through on their own, so they have to have some assistance. So a second type of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion. Um, and facilitated means like help. So this type of diffusion, it needs help. Um, so this uses transport proteins to move other ions and small molecules across the plasma membrane. So if you look here, so this is something called a transport protein and it has an opening through it. So if this type of ion is trying to get across, it can line up with one of these transport proteins and this will allow it to go through the plasma membrane. Okay. So recall back to when we did the bubble membrane lab and you guys, um, you got the rubber band to float on the bubble membrane and then we popped the inner bubble of the rubber band. Um, it's the same thing. So it makes a nice little opening in the plasma membrane that allows certain ions to pass through it. And even though this is called facilitated diffusion, and you need this transport protein um, to help these ions move across the membrane, this is still known as passive transport. Okay. It requires no additional energy to do this. So again, if you look at the diagram, um, do you see how it's like this nice square? Like it fits perfectly through here. So as long as the square lines up, it can easily pass through. So again, think about if you made like that opening with the rubber band in the bubble, if you were just to drop your Q-tip straight through, it just fit perfectly through. It takes no extra energy to get the Q-tip through. Um, the same thing when it comes to facilitated diffusion. Okay, um, So it still is part of passive transport.